Hey everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Roundup. Today we've got a bunch to chat about. So, Platinum, they're now more independent than ever, but with a bit of a catch. Blizzard, they've kind of booted their legacy out of BlizzCon, which is a bit of a kick in the teeth. We've got Steam stuff, we've got Activision looking more heartless than ever, and a rather funny review situation. So be sure to like, sub, ring that bell, truly does help us out. And with that, let's get into the news. So, kicking it off, Platinum, the creators of the likes of Bayonetta and Astral Chain, you know, incredible games, they've received received investment from Chinese tech giant Tencent. Their CEO said that this would allow them to strengthen the foundations of their business and to explore self-publishing. And uh, also, according to them, it is more of a traditional investment instead of one where there's a lot of ownership and, you know, creative decisions done by Tencent. So apparently this is going to have no impact on them as an independent studio bar, you know, funding. Now, that's kind of interesting. It means that, you know, whatever equity is there, it's not enough for Tencent to have a major say. And I've got to imagine here that this is just Tencent spreading investments across as much of gaming as they can, hoping to capitalize off broad sector growth. Now, self-publishing, if you know about Platinum, that is something they've wanted to do for a long time, and supposedly this investment will let them control their own IP, control their own schedules, and basically do, you know, outsourced work less and work in other people's IPs less. And they've made their desire for it to be that way, like, really no secret. I mean, really ever since Microsoft's cancellation of Scalebound, I think I think that must have been the final straw because it was only near Autonoma doing so well, like months after Scalebound was killed, that Platinum basically was saved from financial collapse. And sadly for them, well, Square Enix owns Nier. So hopefully this new partnership with Tencent is not going to have the downsides that you may think of when Tencent appears, and hopefully it'll give them some breathing room. They are some of the, you know, the greatest creators of games when it comes to sheer gameplay, and seeing them just be able to carve their own path, self-publish their own games, I think that really is exciting. Next up, Blizzard. They've axed one of their own games from BlizzCon. It also happens to be one of my favorite games ever, and uh, you know what? Them not having their hands in more esports is probably a good thing, especially after last BlizzCon. You see, last BlizzCon, Blizzard shifted everything over to the Overwatch League as the focus, and that meant that World of Warcraft and StarCraft II were really shafted. It actually forced the entire StarCraft II World Championship series into a single day, and that led to tired casters, tired players, the whole thing was running over time, it was a bit of a mess, so it's no surprise to see Blizzard, uh, well, end the World Champion series of StarCraft 2. Instead, it and Warcraft 3 Reforged tournaments are going to be handled by ESL and DreamHack. Now, this is a three-year deal, and that secures StarCraft 2 and the ESL Pro Tour, and I think that's actually great for people who love StarCraft esports, but... Blizzard made a choice here. StarCraft is one of their most historic franchises. StarCraft II majorly helped to kick off the Western esports resurgence of the last decade. And what have we seen? Well, I think we've seen the Blizzard have decided that StarCraft II does not have a place at their own convention. The game that put them on the map for esports and the franchise that partially defined esports does not have a place at BlizzCon. And yeah, it's typical Activision Blizzard behavior. You obviously know where the numbers are going. All the effort is obviously going into the, I'd say, ill-conceived Overwatch League with its, you know, multi-million dollar team spots, exclusive stream licensing deals of like 40 million a year, all of that stuff. But of course though, if you've actually been paying attention, the Overwatch League is struggling with viewers. It's almost as if it's inorganic as shit. It's lost key casters. It's been plagued with countless games that that are just A, boring, and B, that people just don't care about. Again, much of that because of an extremely boring meta. I mean, they've even been doing wiki embeds to try to boost the thing, which is just pretty embarrassing. So, for StarCraft, we've got four DreamHack events, two ESL ones making up a new circuit. Personally, I'm excited for the games. It is my favorite esport, and I am thrilled that it's got a solid three years of existence, that it's got an increased prize pool and props, you know, Blizzard are funding that. But that said, it's sad to see Blizz abandon their roots and they've done that so much lately. You know, Mike Morheim, the ex-CEO, uh, he's a massive StarCraft guy. He even turned up at the most recent Home Story Cup and ordered everyone in attendance pizza. You know, lovely guy. Uh, but I've got to wonder, if that cycle of leadership, if Mike not being there, if that is nudging them closer to Activision Blizzard Corporate, I mean... Even going through the initial, like, post that Blizzard made, the official one, they said the partnerships were needed to actually make StarCraft Esports continuing happen. Uh, and I think that shows Blizzard just does not consider the opportunity 
cost to actually be worth it. And then as for Warcraft 3, I mean, hey, Warcraft 3 Esports, uh, there's been some fun show matches, but it'll be nice to see that coming back. So that's pretty cool as well. But overall, I'd say this is good news if you're a StarCraft fan and, you know, the future of our favorite game is, uh, it is continued. However, it is Blizzard shedding some of its legacy. And that is always kind of sad to see when you look at where they came from and, you know, you think about where they may be going in a few regards. Okay, next up, some Valve news. So, according to the December uh, Steam Hardware and Software Survey, Simplified Chinese is now the largest language on the platform, actually accounting for 37.8% of users. And that's a 14% increase from the last survey. And that makes it clear that China... Uh, well, to say that it's rising wouldn't really be true, actually, because it's always been quite massive in PC. It's just been really insular. I think it's more accurate to say that it's becoming relevant on the world stage. More Western games are making it to, you know, to China. I mean, we've got Crossfire coming out on Xbox. Who would have thought that would have happened? There's more Chinese stuff, you know, coming into the West. And uh, I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of people live there. Massive population. We're just going to see this sort of thing happen more and more. And I suppose they are, you know, culturally different groups of people, you know, European gamers to US gamers, they're pretty different in their trends. Same, I think, will go for Chinese gamers. And as that becomes a larger global force in the market, we're probably going to see different types of games, you know, stuff like that happening. What will it mean? I've got no idea. You know, we'll see how it goes. But anyway, let's move on. So speaking of Steam, Valve just made it a whole lot easier to buy game soundtracks on its storefront. And that might not be that exciting to hear, but it kind of is in line with Steam just providing lots of good tools for everyone. So previously, you can only buy a soundtrack as DLC. So you have to own the game to buy the soundtrack. That requirement's been lifted. They're adding in a new library system for quickly navigating your collection of game music. And then on the dev side, soundtracks can now actually be sold even if the base game itself is not available on Steam. And uh, developers can upload and they can also manage and just do all of their soundtrack stuff via the partner site without using Steam itself. And you know what? That's It's pretty cool. It's only soft launch now. It's going to be fully launched a bit later. But I think it's a good move. And it's one that shows something we talked about quite recently, yesterday in fact. Steam are committing to giving a good experience to both the devs and the customers, as we said in yesterday's video. Now that said, gotta be real with you here, do you buy game soundtracks on Steam? No, I mean, they're Spotify or YouTube. That's what people are going to use. Anyway, next, let's move on. On the topic of Activision Blizzard, we've got something that makes them seem more heartless and out of touch than normal, which is quite a surprise. So with the country being on fire, you know, it might not be the ideal time for their Australia-themed cosmetic Outback bundle, but hey, if you want a koala gun charm, a sticker of a dead animal that says try harder and a few skins, you can get it in Call of Duty. Rough timing, very rough timing. And you know, if their goal was to launch it now anyway, they probably should have done the usual thing of a capped charity donation. That would have been the correct play here. Uh, that being said, Activision, uh, you know, their support Twitter did like, it did acknowledge fan requests for profit sharing. So there's maybe some hope there. Uh, but still, it seems like they didn't even think about this. They already struggle with their corporate image. So doing that just would have been a win-win. I mean, certainly it's kind of funny that with Australia just being more in people's minds in general because of that. I mean, more people are probably going to buy this, being real. So uh, a funny little situation. I don't think it's really intentional, but it's just like, come on, guys. Think about your PR. Think about how you're perceived. How could you possibly hit the OK Go Live button in that without doing any sort of post or any sort of damage control? I mean, it is so obvious. You wonder how it even happens. Okay, next up, Xbox Series X. So, AMD accidentally showed a fan render of it in their CES keynote. Whoops, but we've since seen an accurate one for Microsoft, and this actually confirms two USB 3 Type A's, a single HDMI, and uh, optical audio. You know what? I'm a bit disappointed there's not more USB ports, and I'm disappointed they're not Type C. If we could just get everyone to go to that, you know, one standard to rule them all, durable, reversible, fast cable, it would be so much better. And to get that, we need hardware leaders like Microsoft to adopt those new standards. So it's pretty disappointing that, you know, USB type A just kind of locked into being relevant for another 10 years. I think that kind of sucks. But I mean, still, it's not a make it or break it thing. Now, also in console news, PlayStation CEO Jim Ryan has said that the PS5's best features have not been announced yet. And that's kind of wild. I mean, we've got no idea what it could be. I mean, assuming this is just a powerful console, fast loading times, it already would be ticking the core boxes that I care about. So I guess we're gonna have to wait. Maybe their plan is to just have something up their sleeve after like a more full Series X reveal. But certainly it's good to hear that they've got something up their sleeve. That's it's gonna be spicy at the very 
very least. And then to cap off today's show, a bit of a different one. So the PC Gamer review of Monster Hunter World really just, it just struck out to me in a way that was uh, a bit odd. It's something that I, I see more reviews do these days. About a third of it was dedicated to the personal and emotive, uh, well, basically it was personal content about why the reviewer often felt uncomfortable having to hunt the monsters in Monster Hunter. Now, to be fair to him, he did not dock the game points. He gave it an 82. By all, you know, it seems like he did a very good, fair, objective review of Iceborne. But really, it's quite interesting. It makes me think about what is the place of the of the reviewer, right? I think this often hops or sort of appears when you see the PC Gamer review. So you sort of expect like an objective review from a publication instead of just thoughts from a guy, even though obviously, yeah, it's just some guy working for the publication. So I think it's very different, like writing for a publication or doing, you know, just being a creator and doing, you know, say a review in YouTube. But there's also times where this seeps into reviews in a different way. And the one that always just comes to the forefront of my mind, of my mind it's Wesley Yin Poole's review of Dead or Alive 6. The one where he went on a seemingly deranged rant about Donald Trump, Ivanka suggesting they were, I think, suggesting they were sleeping with each other, and uh, about how a character in Dead or Alive 6 reminded him of that. And you're just sitting there reading this Eurogamer rev review being like, how did your editor go past this? What the hell are you thinking? How does this make any sense? And more importantly, who are you writing it for? And that's always what I find interesting in reviews. That's what I want to hear from you. Like, you know, do you want a Pokemon review that is talking about how, you know, oh, this is basically cockfighting. Is that animal abuse? You know, is that something you want in your Pokemon review in your Monster Hunter review, you know, a game about hunting monsters? I'm, I'm not quite sure. It's an interesting little situation. I mean, I think it's fine for op-ed content like that. There's an interesting exploration of that. I'm just not that sure it should be in a review. But I've also got to wonder that in a world where reviews are just dominated by open critic, metacritic, rotten tomatoes for movies, do reviewers feel pressure to try to do more stuff there to get more of a personal opinion or something like that? Or not personal opinion, that's what a review is. But you know, more of a, I guess, a secondary musing right? Like this Monster Hunter one. Is there more of a pressure to put that in reviews? And is that something that audiences like? I'd actually be very interested to hear what you've got to say. So do let me know. But other than that, that is it for today's episode of the Roundup. We will have a little bit of content coming out quite soon though on Pokemon because man, if any other game franchise like had the same business model as Pokemon, people would flip their, they flip their shit. It's insane. But with Pokemon, it's like, man, the stuff that's acceptable seemingly there is insane, and uh, it's happening again. So that'll be an interesting one to talk about. Anyway, be sure to check that out. Thank you very much for watching. Be sure to like, sub, and all that good stuff, and I will see you next time.